This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by the Ledger Nano S, the hardware wallet which sets the new standard in security and usability. Get it today at ledgerwallet.com and use the offer code EPICENTER to get 10% off your order. And by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hello and welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Train. And I'm Meher Roy. Our episode today is focused on the Bitcoin block size debate. We have as guests um, Andrew Clifford, who is the president of Bitcoin Unlimited, and G. Andrew Stone, who is the lead developer of Bitcoin Unlimited. So today we are going to talk about uh, how Bitcoin Unlimited as a project came to be, uh, what its fundamental tenets are, and how, what do they see as the path forward. So before we start, we would like um, both of you to give us an introduction and tell us about your background. First, starting from uh, G. Andrew Stone, who we will refer to as Zerg during the interview. In 2012, I was working on a... Uh, open source hardware project and I discovered um, that I was spending a lot of the money that the the project that the board ultimately sold for actually dealing with like um, moving the money around the world because you know parts are sourced in China and then fabrication it happens in China then everything gets shipped to the US and then I ship it out to Europe um, and so it, I kind of was looking for a simpler solution and uh, a more efficient solution and I ran into Bitcoin um, and obviously you know it was not really applicable at that time since it was so small but uh, you know having read the white paper it really kind of caught my attention. And what about you uh, Andrew, Andrew Clifford? Yeah my, my background is in, um, in mainframe systems and in, uh, investment banking, writing financial, uh, accounting systems and trading applications and I actually left that in 2010 to become a writer and it was about two years later uh, late 2012 that I heard about Bitcoin and uh, I realized pretty quickly uh, what a breakthrough it was and the benefit to the world economy that could accrue from sound money and the fact that it was limited to 21 million um, and the mechanism to how to achieve that uh, it was, it was uh, quite exceptional. So um, I immediately became immersed in that subject and we're now over four years on and I'm still immersed in Bitcoin, hoping that it will succeed. And I think it will do a lot of good for the world economy. So, so Andrew, what did that immersion look like? Did you, um, in what ways were you involved? Well, first off, uh, when, when I heard about it, um, I joined Bitcoin Talk and started to contribute there. And it was quite a healthy community. And in fact, it's quite ironic because one of my first posts uh, was about the block size. And I said, this, is, this isn't enough <laughs> to succeed long term. We, uh, it needs to be increased. So that was over four years ago now. Um, and I've been banging on about that like like every few weeks ever since um and there was real momentum to solve it in 2013. um i was okay well the the idea for making millions of bitcoins as in bits uh someone came up with that idea but that ra rather largely got publicized through my efforts um i i initiated the discussion on bitcoin talk and and got it uh, impl well, it became implemented in a number of wallet applications and it's in common usage. Um, and also the XBT ISO code, uh, I realized that that's important for integrating into uh, mainstream financial systems. So I pushed that and, and that has become quite popular as well as a result. So it's really the, these uh, facets of Bitcoin to help, help it succeed um, in the world economy are, are the things that I've tried to push. Uh, and then when uh, Andrew Stone came up with the idea of Bitcoin Unlimited, 
in late 2015, again, I could see that is the best approach uh, to solve these scaling issues. So um, I've been spending quite a few hours a week involved in helping make that succeed since. Cool. So, Zurich, you, so you, you also discovered Bitcoin in 2012. What did your journey look like in, in the Bitcoin space and how did you then end up uh, starting uh, Bitcoin Unlimited? You know, the, the, my, I guess the beginning of my journey was trying to convince uh, some Chinese manufacturers to accept it, actually. Um, I mean, the fact was that I was able to get a prototype, physically get a prototype fabricated and mailed to me faster than I could move the money to China, right? It took more time to do the Western Union transfer than it took for them to fabricate the part and uh, send it over. So I was saying to myself, if only the money could be moved instantly, I would cut, you know, the turnaround time, which is very important uh, in half, right? So from there, I made some investments, but I didn't want to, um, and I also did a quick code review and so forth, but I didn't want to jump in um, to do development uh, for essentially redundancy reasons, uh, you know, because if you put all your you know, I had done investment in Bitcoin, so it's better to then be pulling a salary from, you know, a separate uh, endeavor um, in case Bitcoin fails. Um, but coming around in, you know, 2015, I realized that the promise of Bitcoin as a peer-to-peer -peer payment system worldwide, which is really, um, well, I, I both feel like that uh, is the fundamental basis of its uh of its use as store of value is the fact that it can be used as a peer-to-peer -peer, um, payment system. And also because I feel like that's where it will really affect the world. And when, when that uh, promise started to uh, be uh, fail, I uh, felt like I needed to, you know, become more active in the space. And so uh, coming, out, like, coming out of this, um, I'd been, um, you know, participating a lot in this gold collapsing Bitcoin up forum. And a lot of the guys there had similar ideas. And so the idea of Bitcoin Unlimited really came from, you know, a lot of the conversations happening in that group. We talked briefly before that, uh, you know, Bitcoin Unlimited has been around for a while, right, since 2015, mm -hmm. but I think it was uh, it was after Bitcoin XC. So would you mind just, just running us a little bit through the history of, you know, where in that sequence of, of different clients uh, Bitcoin Unlimited uh, came and, and what's, what sort of happened with, with the other ones in that course as well and, and why you guys felt like the right thing was to do was Bitcoin Unlimited as opposed to supporting... Uh, you know, XT or, or some other approach that existed? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, and it, it, it did come after Bitcoin XT. Um, and I actually uh, began uh, by contributing to Bitcoin XT. I did the uh, traffic shaping uh, in XT. But, you know, uh, XT was still... Um, XT was proposing, if I remember some kind of compromise uh, solution. And also, um, it was, I think, uh, Mike Hearn was leaving at approximately the top, like, I think he sort of left. So there was a question about whether Bitcoin XT was going to continue, right? And that was when on the Bitcoin, um, you know, gold collapsing Bitcoin up uh, forum, we really started reconsidering exactly uh, what these limits should be, and someone proposed that, um, you know, that these non-money protecting functions really should not be consensus um, parameters. And that is really like a fundamental, uh, you know, uh, philosophical difference from, uh, I think, Bitcoin XD, and that's why uh, Bitcoin Unlimited kind of emerged. And, and then... Uh, Bitcoin Classic uh, came a few months later, if I remember correctly, and it um, came out of some work by the Tumin brothers uh, suggesting that the uh, Great Firewall of China could really accept, I think it was like four megabyte blocks. Um, and so, you know, Bitcoin Classic, I think, originally emerged as a 
to propose a compromise at like two or four megabytes. I think they eventually settled on two. So, so this is going to be like one of the main things that, that we'll focus on is the fundamental difference in approach that Bitcoin Unlimited has where, uh, where vis-a-vis something like uh, XT and Classic, which are, mm-hmm. as I understand, um, like both creating the clients for and campaigning for block size increases from 1 MB to some higher value. They might be different for different clients, but Bitcoin Unlimited has a completely different approach where the the block size limit would be removed as a core consensus parameter itself. So we'll get into this topic. Um, but before before we jump there, I would like to quickly ask one question. Is uh, So you, we have all of these different clients, right? All of these different approaches uh, to block size increases. Why is it that you think that all of the Bitcoin users, companies and people that are pro block size increased, why have all of them not kind of converged to support just one client? Why are there, why is the pro block size increase community like fractured into all of these clients today? If I could take that real quickly, I would say it's one of the reasons is because if you get seven developers in a room, you end up with 10 opinions, right? there are a huge number of proposals, right? And honestly, you know, one of them is barely better than another, you know, in many regards. And a lot of people seem to think that their approach is best. And Bitcoin Unlimited, to some degree, came out of that observation in the sense that it um, says, you know, that we should let the future us decide the block size and not come up with some uh, top-down... proposal that we're all going to follow no matter what or have another block size debate right so it was in one sense a reaction to all the proposals and it's sort of ultimately then kind of the ultimate proposal right being based on uh you know uh nakamoto consensus and not yet another algorithm that developers have decided on and are pushing everyone to use so Bitcoin Unlimited, when people hear the, the term Bitcoin Unlimited, you know, one imagines and, and we, we did the same thing. Like, okay, now anybody can create, you know, a block a block of any size. Uh, so, you know, sort of all all limits are off. But can you run us through, first of all, what what where's that name from? Like what, what does the unlimited mean in that context? And what does it mean in terms of block size? Does it really mean a miner could now, you know, Bitfury could create a 30 megabyte block and propagate that? Right. So unlimited does not mean infinite, right? It simply means that there aren't limits. Or in particular, the, the market will pick a limit, right? The code does not create the limit, right? Um, so that's what is meant by Bitcoin Unlimited. And there's also a strong sort of fill up, uh, it's also like refers to a strong philosophy of more like unlimited choice. Okay. And, um, in terms of, uh, the age old question, will a miner create a gigantic block, right? Uh, there are forces, um, you know, in the network that naturally, uh, reduce the, um, likelihood that that will happen. And in fact, honestly, um, that question is actually irrelevant in the face of the X thin work that Peter Shipper did, because the, the, the time to transmit a block is, uh, you know, negligible now. Um, the question is really um, the transaction throughput time, like how many transactions per second can, can you ultimately have? And th- what I'm trying to say by that is um, if someone produced a huge block, then the chances are very good that subsequently you would have a spate of uh, zero length blocks and the average block size would ultimately then come down to the average that the network can um can handle and we kind of uh in my work uh on um empty blocks i kind of showed that uh effect happening uh both uh empirically by looking at the uh rate of um zero length blocks and how they uh, uh depend on the size of the prior block And then I also kind of showed it theoretically. 
let's take a break to talk about the Ledger Nano S, the new flagship hardware wallet by Ledger. I'll pass it over to Ledger CTO, Nicolas Baca, who can tell you all about Ledger's security features and SDK. The Ledger Nano S is a personal security device based on a secure element, a screen and button, so that you can verify everything that is done on the device and make sure that you are really doing what you want it to do. Compared to our previous solution, this device is based on the latest generation secure element, the ST31 from ST Micro. The ST31 is, an, is using a secure ARM core, which means that you can have the same ease of development that you would have on a generic uh, microcontroller, but benefit from the security features of a secure element. Security features uh, include an application firewall at the lowest level that lets you protect applications from each other, which means that you can load multiple applications on the hardware wallet, even post-issuance. And you as a developer will be able to leverage these features to load your own application without our authorization and without any kind of authorization from the vendor. We will be providing this device with an open SDK um, that lets you do anything you want with this device. We provide sample applications for cryptocurrencies, different cryptocurrencies, so Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, and we will also provide a FIDO authenticator and you will be free to add everything you like. For example, you could add some secure messaging, some encrypted chat, and you'll see that the solution is quite powerful and very easy to develop with. The Nano S sets the new standard in hardware wallet security and usability. You can get yours today at ledgerwallet.com. And when you do, be sure to use the offer code EPICENTER to get 10% off your first order. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of EPICENTER. You mentioned, um X thin and with that, the, the block size doesn't really matter. Can you uh, expand on that? A two terabyte hard disk costs like $50, right? And um, so you will be able to store the entire block chain uh, in your life. And also um, really, um, very few people really do need to store the entire block size as well. I understand that there might be a small, you know, security issue and someone could artificially create, like if you stored, let's say the past year of blocks, someone could, you know, painstakingly generate a gigantic fake tree that would give them a lot of money. But this is, this is incredible. This is like, you know, can you imagine the processing power that would be required to do that? Right. This is a very, very theoretical, um, you know, uh, F, uh, like effect. So in reality, even if, um, Moore's law on disks don't exceed the the uh, size of you know blocks being submitted to disks. Uh, you can just enable pruning, right? Which is a feature that Core itself you know actually uh, implemented. So I think that they you know sort of recognize this reality as well. So the issue is not disk space, right? The issue is really uh, network uh, communications, um, and in that case. Um, before XThin, it used to be that when a block was transmitted, the entire one megabyte block had to be transmitted, and that created a certain latency through the network, right? But post XThin, what's happening is all of the transactions are probably already um, dispersed throughout the network. So the block simply says, oh, yes, and that transaction that you already have, and this one, and this one, and this one, it just kind of identifies them, right? So the size of the block is actually really small, referring to existing transactions. And what's actually really interesting about this is that um, what would happen if you don't have those transactions? The answer is you have to go and get them, right? And that does take time. So uh, another way of saying that is if the network's capability, like if the capacity of the network is such that it can't push the transactions fast enough to get to you before the block does, then the latency that it takes you to process the block increases, which means from the miner's perspective that they're more likely to create uh, empty blocks. And so the average block size will uh, fall. Okay, that's that's very interesting. So basically before, Sorry, it's right? It's kind, yeah. uh, kind of thick, right? It's kind of detailed. Yeah, no, but that's, I think that's a super interesting uh, thing I was actually not, not aware of. I think I maybe saw x mentioned before, but I wasn't, it wasn't fully up to date. So basically what you're saying, right, is that in the past, uh, I as a miner would aggregate all these transactions, stuff them in a block, 
mine a block, and then I would send out that, you know, one megabyte or something around. And, you know, it right. takes somebody however long it takes them to get that block. And when they have it, they can start mining on that thing. Right. But with X, then, because the transactions are already being propagated in the network and there are in the mempool of all these different nodes, uh, I can just say, I, I've mined a block, uh, you know, here it is. And, and Meher says, okay, I already have, you know, maybe 95% of those transactions or 98%. Uh, so I just need to get those remaining uh, remaining ones, and then I, I already have to block. And and if I just sort of tell Mayher what to include there, that's much smaller and propagates much faster. Right. Now, the, there's, there's a bit that he ha that he hasn't said yet. Is X thins even better than that. It will predict the ones that you're missing and send those with the abbreviated block. And in fact, uh, a recent uh, uh, log report showed that there were no missing transactions in an entire day for a node. And it predicts okay. which ones are missing by sharing so, a so, blue yeah. so, so hundreds, if not thousands of blocks go through without a single missed uh, you know, transaction in today's level of use because the network capacity far exceeds wor worldwide the, you know, our current use of it. Okay, that's just, this is amazing. Yeah, so, this so is that's amazing. kind of the proof, right? The fact that, that no transactions have been missing from XThin blocks for a long time. Yep. And then XThin is the standard. Um, are all blocks XThin at the moment? Uh, uh, only B, BU and uh, XT and Classic are all using it. Can, can you explain what XThin is briefly? Is it a protocol? Is it what is it? Who uses it? And so it's a protocol. Like um, and um, so just you guys might all have an aha moment when I say that uh, after Exton came out, uh, Core implemented compact blocks, which is sort of almost exactly the same. I think that they don't uh, do this uh, transaction prediction, so they have slightly higher um, retry rates. But I think theirs are more in the 95, 98 percent. I haven't tested it myself. This is just what I hear. So do you guys know what compact blocks is? No. Okay, no, so the idea is um, instead of including, it's, it's, this is not rocket science. Instead of including the full transaction in a block, you simply uh, include uh, it's the transactions you know, uh, hash, right? It's SHA-256, right? Uh, but then you can observe that with relatively few transactions, say millions, right? running around the system, you don't really need a 256-bit identifier. Uh, so you could just chop that a little bit and only send like the first 64 bits or whatever, first 128 bits. And so you can gain uh, you know, additional uh, compression by sending a partial SHA-256 instead of the transaction itself. And then on the other side, um, you know, the block is reconstructed uh, on the receiving side. And of course, um, if there was a SHA-256, you know, or a, a SHA-64 collision and you put the wrong transaction in the block, then ultimately the block's, you know, signature, uh, yeah, the block's um, hash wouldn't match. And so you, there's no chance that you're going to, uh, I mean, th the chance of you, uh, constructing an incorrect block is the same as the chance of two people creating a Bitcoin wallet with the same address in it, right? Almost impossible. So why did why did Core um, not also adopt Xtin? Why did they go with uh, some other thing called compact blocks? I think that uh, this. Um, goes into political and personal reasons, which only core themselves can know. I think there's a huge amount of not invented here uh, attitude in core. And I think they see Bitcoin Unlimited as a threat to their business model. Um, and so it would be, you know, bad to uh, suggest that a single advantage. I'll give you an example. Um, when I first, um, I didn't write X then, but I put uh, the announcement out on Reddit in the R Bitcoin um, users group, and it got like 150, 200 upvotes. It was right at the very top. And then I edited the original post, and I said, you know, this work 
was done under Bitcoin Unlimited and the posting was removed within five minutes. So I do think this is like a political thing. But what it effectively means is like for, correct me if I'm wrong, but there have been like a lots, lots of research papers that have um, investigated uh, the economic behavior of miners, always assuming that uh, it takes time for a block to go from one miner to another miner. Mm -hmm. and based based on based around this a lot of strategies like you know selfish mining uh network analyses have been done and i'm i'm pretty sure there are like 25 or 30 academic papers that that do this but what you're saying is something like xthin basically changes the dynamic completely that uh, it takes very little time for the blocks to be transmitted between the miners and it effectively removes the need for a 1 mb cap Yes, absolutely. I mean, if um, m uh, particularly the the time to transmit a block is no longer proportional to the block size, really, right? Mm. Um, or it's proportional to a factor divided by thousands, right? So it's essentially a constant size, um, given today's you know networking capabilities. It, but that all that all does presume that the transactions are fully propagated, right? So where we get to an interesting case is in a theoretical case where we're far above, probably far above 10 megabyte block sizes, right? Where the transactions aren't fully propagated. And what's really interesting about that is then um, what happens is that um, because a miner hasn't fully propagated the block, uh, or because the receiving miner hasn't fully validated the block, he has to produce, um, um, zero length blocks, right? Which a lot of people think are evil, uh, but I think they, they came to that conclusion without really thinking about it. Because what a zero length block in this case says is, the full transaction set wasn't propagated to me, so I want, need to slow down the processing of the Bitcoin network, right? And this is how like a small miner is no longer penalized uh, by uh, these sort of issues, because he can simply produce um, zero length blocks and you know his essentially hash he's essentially doing a hash power weighted vote saying i think that the network should uh handle fewer transactions right and that will uh you know in the end uh create a fee market right um just like uh uh you know peter risen's paper was suggesting that tr block propagation time will create fee market but that fee market Will be naturally um, will naturally come about due to the limitations of the Bitcoin network itself. It won't be arbitrarily chosen at one megabyte, right? And because of that, you can't really imagine that an altcoin will outperform it because it's performing at the limits of the global network. So anyway, that's like the fundamental philosophy behind Bitcoin Unlimited, right? And why we believe you can have uh, block sizes that the developers do not limit. Okay, that's that's super interesting. Now, just to just to have a clearer picture of this. Now, with X thin uh, blocks, how how much space does a, a you know one megabyte X thin block take up? And and what about you know a eight or ten megabyte block? Andrew, do you remember what the compression rate was? I, I think in the ballpark of 50 to 1, so 20 KB, including the Bloom filter. Yeah. Wow, this is really quite mind-blowing because... Genuinely mind-blowing. Why, yeah, why on earth? There's no reason. There's no it, real reason still why. At one by the way, test. we've done tests on the propagation rate uh, from like China through the... Uh, Great Firewall China, right out to America and uh, like London. And these rates were, you know, uh, in like the tens to hundreds of milliseconds. They were just a bit above the uh, speed of light uh, because it's a great advantage uh, when you're propagating small blocks. The, you know, the China Firewall can often let them through, right? They, for some reason, the, uh, you know, we, we just kind of empirically, you know, run tests and then try and figure out what's going on with the Great Firewall China. But it seems to drop packets and connections uh, 
you know, proportionally to the bandwidth, right? So if you just pop 20K through uh, once every 10 minutes, it's more likely to let that go through. So, okay, just to, just to test my understanding. So, so assume like I'm, I'm like this um, small miner, let's say in Iceland, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, before X10, uh, when a block was generated, uh, one MB of data need, needed to come to me uh, with the block and then I would start building on I would validate that block and start building on it. Yeah, and the worst it, case too, uh, sorry to interrupt, is that you have to remember that every hop in the Bitcoin network would fully validate that block, uh, you know, receive it, validate it fully, test all the signatures and send it on, right? Yeah. So that's important too, but go on. Yeah, so now with, now with X10, um, the, the normal operating case is that I will already have heard of all of the transactions that are gonna be put into the block Mm -hmm. And I just need to know the, let's say the transaction numbers. So that is very, very little data, mm -hmm. right? So that is around 20 KB. And out here, like if, if I've heard all of the transactions before the block was made, and uh, then I can just do with receiving 20 or 30 KB of data and that's it. Here the risk is that um, some, some adversary might spin up a lot of nodes in the network and manipulate the network in a way that me, the small miner in Iceland, uh, does not receive all of the transactions. My transaction mempool is not updated because some adversary is gaming the network that I, I don't receive my transactions, right? That is the risk. A Sybil attack. Yes, that's a, the Sybil attack is the risk, right? So because of this risk, now the question becomes, what would I do if that sort of thing were to happen? So what you're saying is, if that sort of thing were to happen, as long as the network would ensure that that 20 or 30 KB of data about the new block reaches me, there might be a chance that I, I know the header of the new block, but I cannot validate all of the transactions in it. But just knowing the header, I could start building the next block, assuming that this 20 or 30 kilobyte header is, is correct. Yes. That's not quite the way it happens in the network today, but that could definitely occur. Okay. So the way it happens in the network today is that all of the miners uh, have registered as miners in all the other miner networks. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but they're not actually mining with any hash power in the other mining pools networks. But what happens is that uh, a miner sends a block update out to all of its you know, miners, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the competitive miner receives that block update. And so then uh, it gets the, you know, the header and it can start, um, can start mining zero, um, you know, uh, an empty block until it receives the full block. It's, it's just a small detail. But the end result is exactly the same. And you are right that uh, your if you didn't do that, um, if you didn't have this uh, validationless mining, it's called going on, then um, you would fall back to exactly what you're talking about. Okay. I think Gavin uh, first created a patch actually to do that. It's called headers first mining or something like that. Today's magic word is unlimited. That's U N L I M I T E D. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. What is your estimate? What kind of um, block sizes do you think the network could support today? <laughs> I, I don't think that uh, that supposition about that is really all that that helpful, right? I think that they're much higher than they are today. I think a better way is to turn that round and say, what block size is the demand out there for legitimate demand? And that might be one and a half megabytes at the moment. And then we can look at the historical growth rate in transactions because before blocks got full, they weren't full and there was an uptrend in, in the size of them. And we can predict that forward and we can get an idea of what the block size should be based on historical trends. 
and and it's it's a number to know. Obviously, you can't predict the future, but but it's better to have some information than nothing. And I think that should be the ballpark of where we say blocks should be, is based on the historical trend prior to them being full, and the network can definitely handle that with the um, X thin and the compact block. Um, propagation methods. One thing to add is that we still don't have <clears throat> very fast um, block propagation for, um, for resyncing a node. So when a node is offline and needs a thousand blocks, they still have to be sent full size. Um, but in the normal course of events, nodes should have quite a bit of long periods of uptime and that's not a, a major consideration. Cool. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about Bitcoin Unlimited as an organization. Is it um, is it a nonprofit currently, or did you guys have a formal organization that's that's kind of behind uh, the project? I can um, give you some background on that. the The organization was an unincorporated, has articles, and they're on our website, BitcoinUnlimited.info. And it had in there the provision to become a registered nonprofit. And that's what we did back in August uh, last year. So it is a registered nonprofit. Um, but uh, as we're still in the nascent stage, we're not really doing a lot with the nonprofit, but we're building the organization. Uh, and uh, it has uh, about 50 members at the moment. Um, and that would lead into the question of how people become a member and, and uh, uh, the, the way that is done is that we have a forum, which is the bitco.in forum, um, where we can have censorship free discussion and that's been the home for BU and people are welcome to join that and if they support BU they're welcome to apply for membership and uh, membership is free. Uh, and people have to evidence an online history, such as on Reddit or Twitter um, or Bitcoin Talk, uh, showing or medium showing a history of positive writings about Bitcoin. Doesn't have to agree exactly with what Bitcoin Unlimited says, but then you just want to uh, make sure you're not, you know, a sock puppet, right? <laughs> some history. Yeah, Maybe. some history is a real person. Mm -hmm. um, and then the membership will uh, decide, uh, the existing membership decides on the admission of new members, which is the best way to maintain the integrity of an organization. So you would have a, a vote, regular vote, when new people want to become members? We do. Every couple of months we have a vote and we induct um, a number of new members. Uh, not a huge number, but it's growing. Um, and and that's good. That's good. And to see. how many members did we induct, Andrew, the last time? Uh, we had a vote uh, like a week ago. Sorry. Yeah, it, yeah. January the first was our last um, vote. It finished, and we had eight new members hmm. join then, all with good good track records of writing about Bitcoin and interest in the space. Investors, developers. Um, so we get we've got some very good people in the membership now. And are you guys trying to be um, exclusive with that or have a certain high standard or, or what's the, because 50 seems like a very, uh, very low number given also the, the recognition that Bitcoin Unlimited has. So are you guys intentionally trying to keep that fairly uh, limited? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which would be slightly ironic, I admit. I, but, uh, <laughs> I, no, we don't want to limit the membership. It would be great if, you know, if everyone who wanted Bitcoin to succeed um, could become a member, but um, obviously there's a lot of different opinions in the Bitcoin space. Um, and some people have opinions which are so strong and so divergent from the ethos of Bitcoin Unlimited that they probably wouldn't make a good member. But that is up to our members to decide. Um, so we welcome all applications um, and the members normally accept you know the vast majority of applications, uh, but but some will get rejected, um, and that's how the organisation maintains its integrity. And I'd say uh, for potential members, it's important to understand that um, you don't want to become a member just because it's cool or whatever. Uh, 
the the job of the members is to vote on you know the proposals and these proposals will ultimately uh you know result in changes to the bitcoin client right so you have to be willing to put in a few hours you know i'm preferably a lot of time understanding you know the bitcoin um uh, environment in general, right? But then a few hours really studying the proposals and talking about them. Um, and, you know, if you're for large blocks, but you don't have the time to help steer Bitcoin Unlimited, then membership is probably not for you, right? But if you want to actively uh, shape uh, what the Bitcoin Unlimited client is going to be, then, you know, we want you. And, and those proposals will be uh, on, on what kind of basis are you talking about? So a few hours on a, on a weekly basis or? I think we tend to have votes like once a quarter or once a month. It would really depend on how many proposals are presented. Uh, and any member is allowed to present a proposal or uh, they can sort of sponsor a proposal presented by a non-member. Okay, so so somebody who's you know who's knowledgeable about Bitcoin and has a you know a, I would probably a decent technical understanding and is willing to spare a, a few hours uh, per quarter uh, evaluating uh, you know different proposals for Bitcoin Unlimited would be suitable for a membership. Absolutely. Okay, very interesting. Well, uh, I mean, we'll definitely post a link. So if people are interested in, in joining as members, they'll know, uh, know where to go. I think that sounds quite, uh, quite interesting. Also, perhaps as a way to just be a bit more uh, engaged with it, uh, you know, whatever one's opinion, actually, I, I find I think that would be very interesting to see what, what the developments are. Moving on to the next thing, one of one thing that stands out about Bitcoin Unlimited is that you guys have uh, articles of federation. Why did you choose to do that? And, and what are some of the main, um, main ideas in, in those articles? I wrote the articles or uh, pulled the articles together from um, you know, a lot of writings of other people. Um, so I'll, I'll begin with why I did that before um, writing a single line of code. And then maybe Andrew can talk a little bit more about it from a, you know, from the president's perspective. But I, I started by writing the articles because um, I felt like the there was no process in the um, in the the um, method that was um, occurring in Bitcoin Core. It seemed like there was a lot of talk about consensus, but it seemed like consensus was actually defined by when one of the leaders said there was consensus, there was no quantitative way of measuring consensus. Um, and uh, it seemed even that um, like proposals uh, would not even be allowed to um, exist even. Uh, you know, they wouldn't get a BIP number, for example, unless they um, adhere to certain people's opinion as to know, the way these things should work. And so it seemed like there was a, um, a veneer of process, but the truth was it was like a veiled dictatorship. And I didn't feel like, um, I felt like many voices were being, uh, you know, ignored and crushed through that process. So I didn't want Bitcoin Unlimited to be like that. It was never my intention. Uh, and in fact, one of my own BUIP proposals was recently uh, not passed to kind of prove that Bitcoin Unlimited is not a dictatorship by me, right? So just to continue a little bit further, the, the, the articles that we have are, are trying to create a new model of, of, of a democratic development where we really do try and get a feel for what, what, the, what the ecosystem needs from Bitcoin and produce software which delivers that. And the BU members are a proxy for the wider Bitcoin community. And, and therefore, when they vote on a software change, and one of the software changes that was rejected early on was that RBF, the replaced by fee. Um, and one reason is the, is the damage that it does to the zero confirmation business, which was working really well for Bitcoin prior to blocks being full. And in fact, the zero conf 
is, is an entry point for new users to Bitcoin. They're often the first experience that people will have is buying a beer with Bitcoin. It used to be, but it probably isn't any longer. Um, and, and who knows, someone who buys a beer with Bitcoin may suddenly understand this is wonderful and becomes a major player and runs up 100 nodes or whatever. You know, these people are not joining Bitcoin now because the, the entry barrier for, for joining is, is higher because zero comp transactions are not happening. So, so RBF was rejected by our membership. Um, and this, this is the democratic aspect of development and action. And we think that we are mirroring what the ecosystem wants and needs more than any other uh, implementation. Let's take a short break to talk about JAX. JAX is a multi-coin wallet created by the people at Decentral. Now in the past, if you had a whole bunch of cryptocurrencies, it was a pain to handle them. You either had to leave them on an exchange which was insecure, or you had to have all these different wallets, which was a hassle. Fortunately, now with Jax, those medieval days of darkness, misery, and suffering are over. Jax supports multiple cryptocurrencies and new ones are being added. But it's not just storing cryptocurrencies you can do with Jax, but you can also exchange them directly from within inside the wallet thanks to their Shapeshift integration. And since there's only one seed, Jax makes it super easy to back up and sync to your other devices. Jax works with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and has browser extensions for Firefox and Chrome. So go to jax.io, that's J A X .io, to download the wallet and get started today. We'd like to thank Jax for their support of Epicenter. Bitcoin Unlimited has been around since uh, 2015. Uh, what's, what's the status right now? What percentage of the miners are supporting Bitcoin Unlimited or of the nodes? And, and what kind of uh, threshold do you think is necessary to reach until Bitcoin Unlimited actually kind of, you know, gets activated and bigger blocks get created? Yes, at, at the moment, um, the mining percentage is about 15%. Um, which is quite a healthy percentage of the mining. And of the full nodes, about 7%, 8% is the peak that it's reached. Uh, these percentages do need to be higher before um, we will see larger blocks. Um, but I want to actually just go back, go to a, another aspect of Bitcoin Unlimited, which is that we don't want to replace core with Bitcoin Unlimited. We, we want a new environment where there'll be multiple implementations, decentralized development. So the, the model we would like to see is that all develop uh, implementations have less than 50% of the nodes and 50% of the mining power. And that provides lots of checks and balances in the development as well. Uh, it makes Bitcoin stronger with, with the decentralized development. So although we may see Bitcoin Unlimited, we don't, we don't know whether it will happen or not, go above 50% and we get bigger blocks activated, the long-term goal would be to go back below 50% again and see a landscape of competing implementations. And we get Darwinian natural selection, the benefits of it. That's the vision, the, the longer-term vision. So, so let's say in, in the future, um, the block size does does end up going in the in the path you think you you want it to go, which is the unlimited block size set by the natural dynamics of the of the network, right? What would a transition from the current regime of one MB blocks to a regime of uh, blocks uh, set by the network look like? How would that transition happen? What Bitcoin Unlimited is doing is, is giving quite a bit of control to the miners about the block sizes they'll create, which, which is really the only way that, that it can work. Uh, the miners have all the skin in the game with, 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 with the, the financial investment and the SHA-256 hashing power. So they will look at what happens if if we don't know whether it will happen, but if at the BU mining percentage gets up in the region of 70 to 75 percent, they'll be looking at triggering a hard fork. So we'll liaise with them 
um, and probably announce a flag date a month out and so and agree with the miners that that greater than one MB blocks will be produced after that date. And hopefully a lot of the other full nodes on the network will upgrade. And even the core ones can remain core. All they need to do is change that um, number to be instead of one up, up it to six or eight or something, depending on what people want. Um, or it could ha use our patch for emergent consensus, which will be a relatively small patch that we can give to core around that time. They can use it if they want. And at that point, the miners can then create a larger block. Um, we would expect that the other 25% of the miners would see the writing on the wall and most of them would switch at that point. So there should be 95% mining power by the time the flag date is seen. Now, if nothing happens ahead of the flag date, then of course that could be canceled. Um, and, but uh, it, it should function in, in a manner like that. It'd be quite a smooth process. Right now, you said Bitcoin Unlimited was a 16%. I think the segregated witness uh, share is around 25%. And, and segregated witness has a 95% uh, activation threshold, I think. And of course, segregated witness uh, is the, the proposal and the favorite way uh, to achieve scalability or indirectly achieve scalability by the Bitcoin core team. So, you know, it, it seems like both are very far from breaking through. I was wondering, why doesn't Bitcoin Unlimited not do the unlimited way of managing the block size and also add segregated witness in there? Because I, I could imagine, you know, if one could sort of combine those forces of support, it might be much more likely that uh, hard fork would go through. How do you guys look on that? Uh, I think that that's actually a fairly interesting proposal. Um, I haven't looked at the code line by line, but from a structural standpoint, it's not my favorite uh, solution um, for a variety of reasons that basically are summed up with the word technical debt. And what that basically means is you create a lot of problems for people working on the code in the future, right? For example, um, you know, you're creating a transaction, right? And it's actually completely valid, but it's, let's say it's not a segregated witness transaction uh, because you screwed up the, the witness section of it, but it's going to be, it's going to look completely valid for, for the old rules, right? And so now God knows what's going to happen to that transaction, right? If it's improperly formatted. Um, an ex a similar example actually we have today of this same sort of design problem is the fact that every once in a while somebody accidentally um, creates a transaction with a gigantic uh, uh, miner's fee, right? Because um, in you know today's transactions, um, you don't explicitly say what uh, how many bitcoins you're you're giving to the miners. It's just uh, if you add up all the inputs, uh, you know, and then you add up all the outputs, then the miners get the difference, right? So every once in a while, someone will make a big mistake and they'll accidentally send the miners a couple hundred Bitcoins, right? Um, so this is the sort of thing that uh, creates technical debt, right? And it's much better to create a simple transaction format where it's very hard to um, mess it up, basically. Uh, so I haven't heard a word from Core about a compromise. Um, and you have to... It, it actually begs the question... Um, if we're going to do a hard fork anyway, then why should we do a segregated witness soft fork, right? Let's take that technology and make it into a hard fork, right? And I haven't heard any proposals uh, from them about that, right? Um, and actually, that same observation does make a lot of the large blockers wonder at the promise of core to increase the block size down the road, right? Um, why have a soft fork now if you're planning to ever increase the block size in the future, uh, which I think you know was promised? Because um, you get the worst of both worlds, right? You incur the technical debt of a soft fork, and yet you're still having a hard fork. Um, but I would, you know, I would bring something like that um, to the membership and see what they say, and that would start me actually analyzing the segregated witness code for its, you know, quality and completeness. I will just add that we do actually have a, um, a BUIP for us 
a hard hard fought Segwit amendment, and that's uh, that's in our list of billups that have not yet been readied for voting upon. Yeah, I mean, I, I I could imagine that this would at least maybe get some people over into the camp, right? I mean, there's certainly also a whole set of startups, you know, from Lightning Network and uh, or sidechains or RSK or a, a whole set of uh, startups, right, that uh, want something like segregated witness, and uh, and the, you know whatever their position would be on on the block size. So they might uh, they might be sort of you know come into into the Bitcoin Unlimited camp if if support was for that. Yeah, it's interesting, and that's you know why we would consider it. The a lot of those tech like uh, Bitcoin Unlimited is not against Lightning at all, right? We're essentially for Lightning and would like to uh, let it. I mean, I think Lightning has uh, you know some really interesting use cases, right? I'm not sure if scalability is. One of them, because as people have pointed out, it scales the number of transactions that a particular user can make, but it doesn't really scale the number of users, right? Um, but there's lots of great use cases for it. I don't think that segregated witness is the only path to getting to Lightning at all, right? And we have um, several proposals down, you know, um, as Andrew was saying, that I think uh, lightning can be built upon, right? Because basically, in order to implement lightning, you got to clean up a couple of mistakes that you know exist with the current uh, transaction format. Let's still assume, though, that n no compromise happens. We we are stuck at this place where uh, there's a significant minority that wants to go in different directions one one of them unlimited one of them segwit maybe some other ones and uh, you know a year from now we're at the same point or a year and a half from now we're at the same point it's just there's no progress there it seems at some point right the the best solution might be or one solution might be i don't know if you guys think it would be the best solution in a, in a situation like that is to have something like we had in Ethereum, right? Where you have Ethereum Classic, Ethereum, uh, the regular Ethereum, and you know, and there's a split, even if there's not an overwhelming majority. Do you guys think at some point that's that could be uh, the best solution? I I think this would be something that would have to go to the uh, BU. Well, it would be a, BU, a BUIP about anything that would create a permanent fork. What you're talking about is, say, a minority fork. Um, that's off the table at the moment, as far as we're concerned. We still think that a hard fork can happen. Um, we're relatively early days in the process, and Andrew Stone can tell you about our new release, which is due out imminently, and that should generate quite a bit of interest and excitement. So we, we really are hoping not to be where we are here in a year's time. Um, so that is quite hypothetical. Um, a lot of things will happen before then. It's important to remember that uh, Bitcoin Unlimited always follows the hash power majority uh, yeah, to the extent that we can code that. Um, that's what we mean by emergent consensus. Uh, unless the, um, the uh, monetary property, unless like a transaction were to or a block were to undermine the monetary properties of Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, we will stick with um, the hash power majority uh, regardless of what, you know, that is. So, it re so to create this, uh, this fork that you're talking about would, um, you know, be uh, changes to both the philosophy. It'd be almost a different project, maybe built on top of BU. Um, because it would change both, you know, code changes and philosophical changes. Um, personally, like um, as early as I think 2013, I was um, commenting that I thought that there was maybe room for three coins in in this world. One was um, an app like uh, Ethereum style, uh, actually four coins, uh, an anonymous coin, a uh, store of value like Bitcoin, and then a microtransaction coin, right? Um, and that would presume, now the question is, the value of a store value coin can be undermined if this micro coin can do the job just as well, right? 
and with you know reasonable block size increases um, at at this point uh, you know Bitcoin can be both this you know small transaction coin and uh, a store of value coin so I don't see right now you know this uh, this fork to be imminent yeah, it's certainly not imminent. It's just um, there's always there's just a question whether it will be possible to come to some kind of agreement. And I think what's also interesting, right? We we've done many episodes with sort of new blockchain proposals, right? New new blockchain networks, mm-hmm. and and one of them, one of the topics that we see coming up again and again and again, and that everybody's thinking about is how do you have some governance on chain that you can resolve questions like this and so that one doesn't have a situation where you know there's differing opinions about where the protocol should go and there's just no real way of resolving it so if it doesn't happen right this this may come up yeah combining the governance with the blockchain is like a fascinating concept but it's certainly beyond the scope of bitcoin unlimited yes and and really, there's only one thing wrong with Bitcoin, and that is the block size. The rest of it just requires optimizations and, and improvements. There's nothing fundamentally wrong that would probably require blockchain government governance to fix. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Yeah, I mean, I think for for Bitcoin, it's uh, it's not feasible, right? I think one probably has to uh, program that in from the very start, and. Uh, and there's certainly pros and cons to both, right? Having a, a, an in, indirect governance mechanism in Bitcoin where essentially you're choosing by choosing the client or by the hash rate is also a, a way of doing it. This is it because the, the network is a balance between the miners and the non-mining full nodes. And this is a major difference with our emergent consensus proposal in the, uh, the BIP100 initiated by Jeff Garzik, which was purely a minor voting proposal. With, with our emergent consensus, the miners will experience pushback from the full nodes beyond a certain level where the miners are creating blocks which are damaging to the network um, financially. So, so that, that is a governance mechanism within uh, the emergent con- consensus so that the ecosystem as a whole has influence on the uh, on the block sizes just beyond the rate of transactions coming in. Cool. Well, uh, we're, we're at, the, at the end of our episode, but uh, Andrew and Zerk, uh, thanks so much for coming on. It was extremely interesting learning about your work in Bitcoin Unlimited. Thank you. Thank you very much. And of course, we'll have links to, to the resources, the Bitcoin Unlimited websites. There is some, uh, some papers as well. Uh, Zurg mentioned the one he wrote. That there's another one about uh, transaction fee, transaction fee market, uh, and a whole bunch of other information there. And we'll also be linking to the place for those who want to get involved in the project to become a member, that they can uh, you know, let them know of their interest and prove that they are indeed human being and not... <laughs> not a, an account commanded by the forces of enemy or an evil and yeah with that we are at the end of our show so thanks so much to our listener for listening we will be back uh, next week and uh, you can of course find this show and many other shows on uh, let's talk bitcoin.com and if you want to support the show then uh, please uh, leave us an itunes review that helps new people uh, find the show we appreciate that very much so thanks so much and look forward to being back next week Thank you.